And so here, we're going to talk about evaluation of the big and bulky uterus. So enlarged uterus is really one of the most common indications for gynec ultrasound. And so what we'll do in this case is we'll really focus on pathological process that affect the myometrium because primary endometrial abnormalities rarely present, they may present with vaginal bleeding, but they rarely present with enlarged uterus on physical examination. And so the first question, the most common question we often need to answer is that adenomyosis or is that myoma? Because both are very common pathological conditions that affect women of all ages. They're often asymptomatic, but if you have symptoms, they can have pelvic pressure, they can have menorrhagia, occasionally severe enough to cause anemia, or they can have dysmenorrhea, particularly with adenomyosis, and they sometimes may have reproductive dysfunction, for example, in submucous of uh, myoma. And so we'll talk about the globular bulky or lobulated uterus. Now, in adenomyosis, and we used to, up to several years ago, we used to really not be, you know, be focusing on the difference, but it's really a different process. In adenomyosis, there is chronic disruption of the basal endometrium to myometrium boundary, the junctional zone. And so the endometrial glands and the stroma migrate in the myometrium. And as these glands be bleed cyclically, they cause hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the adjacent myometrium. And it can be a diffuse of focal process. By contrast, myomas are benign smooth muscle tumors that contain variable amount of smooth muscle and fibrous tissue, and they have a pseudocapsule. So they should be well, really well defined, and their growth is estrogen and progesterone dependent. So this is a the pathology of uh, Adenomyosis, you can see that there are no borders to these lesions, and we'll talk about the ultrasound appearance. By contrast, myomas all are well encapsulated, and so they should present as well-defined lesions. In my mind, there is no such thing as an ill-defined myoma. Ultrasound is really helpful uh, because sometimes in, in large lesions, it's hard to see the borders, and it's hard to penetrate just with vaginal examination. The 3D coronal reconstruction really help in evaluating the junctional zone, which is right there at the border between the endometrium and the biometrium. And finally, uh, and you know, in the US, we don't do ultrasound ourselves. Oftentimes we depend on the sonographers. I think having cynically is really important to appreciate the echo texture of the myometrium that you may not be able to you know, detect so quick, so, so well, on still images. So a few numbers, uh, ultrasound has pool sensitivity of 84% almost and specificity of 64% in differentiating adenomyosis from myoma. Of course, it depends on the expertise of the uh, person doing the ultrasound. And so what are the findings? So in adenomyosis, there are findings related to ectopic endometrial glands in the myometrium, and you'll see echogenic nodules or striations from emanating from the endometrium into the myometrium. Or you can have cystically dilated glands that will present themselves as myometrial, myometrial cysts or lollipop diverticuli extending from the endometrium into the myometrium. And you may see, just like you see on MR, the ill defined thickened uh, uh, junk nozzle. The smooth muscle changes that are due to the uh, smooth muscle proliferation caused by adenomyosis, you may have asymmetric myometrial thickening with ill-defined borders and coarse echo texture of the myometrium with this Venetian blind appearance, this kind of streaky shadowing coming from the myometrium. And you can have vascular changes. There, there may be increased vascularity and you can have penetrating myometrial vessels. So let's look at the example. These are some of the smooth muscle changes. This is an enlarged sort of globular uterus. With, and you can see here that there's this streaky shadowing from the steomyomid from the Venetian blind. And this MR here confirms marked thickening of the junctional zone in this patient with adenomyosis. The patient presented with pelvic pain. Another example, these are the endometrial glands into the myometrium. You can have these echogenic nodules 
kind of these cystic areas and this lollipop type cystic areas extending from the endometrium into the myometrium. And sometimes you can see these um, echogenic lines that are projecting from the endometrium into the myometrium. You can see it very well on the coronal 3D reconstruction. Again, same patient with video clips that I think is very helpful to see all these echogenic nodules as well as cystic changes in this patient with extensive adenomyosis. Again, this is a more subtle case, but what you see here is thickening of the junctional zone. And on the clip, you can see the cystically dotted lines in the subendometrial region right there, and the corresponding MR showing the adenomyosis. This is a more subtle case. All you see here is sort of asymmetric thickening of the uh, myometrium with kind of an echogenic areas. You can see the penetrating vessels here. And then again, if you want to contrast the vascularity of adenomyosis, you can see these penetrating vessels in the myometrium versus in myoma, the vascularity will be kind of displaced surrounding the lesion. This is an interesting case. This is a cystic adenomyoma where this is an 18-year-old woman which had a history of pelvic pain. And basically what it looks like, a cystic lesion in the myometrium that looks like endometrioma. And it's not surprising because what happens is that basically it's a cyst which is lined with endometrial gland and stroma and it undergoes cyclical bleeding. And so this case was actually confirmed by aspiration. It's a rare lesion. They're basically just case reports in the literature. Now let's talk briefly about myoma and what we'll talk about some more problem cases. But basically they cause mass effect. And the smooth muscle changes will have a world appearance. You can have shadowing because there's a lot of fibrous tissue sometimes in those myomas. They will cause mass effect and the vessels will be displaced. So this is a classic example. Anybody, you know, everybody will make this diagnosis. But the problem is these are where there's location, atypical ultrasound appearance, and what do we do when there is growth of a myoma? So location is, of course, key. So you have substirosal, intramural, but the one we, we are some more concerned about because they can cause problem on these patients is the submucosal ones. As you can see here, okay, so this is a, it's plain the endometrium, but it's classic appearance of a myoma. Otherwise, it's hypoechoic shadowing. And what we need to try to tell the clinician whether it's less than or more than 50% intramural, because if they are, they are predominantly submucosal, then you can do just hysteroscopic removal, versus if not, then they may need myomectomy. So that's why it's important to try to localize the submucosal uh, myoma correctly, and sometimes the so 3D again will help. In this, this particular case, it's more than 50% submucosal. Sometimes they will cause issues. This is a 37-year-old woman who presented to the emergency department with very heavy vaginal bleeding. And on examination, there was a mass protruding in the cervix. And sometimes they're really difficult to diagnose because, you know, with the vaginal probe, you're so close to the area of interest that you can see here that there is a mass in the cervix. You can see the vessels leading to this mass. And sometimes I found that transperineal Scanning when you put the transducer on the patient's labia would be helpful. Because here you see the transducer is here. This is the vagina, and you see this myoma that is kind of tried to, um, you know, protrude itself, try to basically deliver itself through the vagina. And these patients underwent an emergency stroscopic resection because she was, you know, markedly anemic. Now, the other dilemma we can have is: is that a submucosal myoma? Or is that a polyp if you see predominantly endometrial mass? So myoma, as we said, tend to be hypoechoic, may have shadowing, tend to have a broad attachment to the myometrium, versus endometrial polyp tend to be more echogenic. They may have cystic spaces. They can have a stalk or broad attachment, one or the other, but they often have a feeding vessel. And of course, saline infusion can be very, very helpful. So we have two examples. This is a myoma, submucosal, and you can see it has a broad attachment. It's also hypoechoic with some areas of shadowing versus this lesion here. And when you do the saline infusion, you can clearly see that it has a relatively narrow attachment. There are actually multiple polyps. And if you put color, you can see that there is a 
eating vessel in the in the animal poly. That's also pretty characteristic. But there's some pitfalls, especially if you have a very pedunculated myoma. You want to make sure that you know how you measure it and whether it's included in measurement or not. And I have seen people miss exophytic pedunculated sundial fibroids or very lateral because they don't bother scanning above the uterus. So it's really always important to scan above the uterus to, to make sure we don't miss a large uh, sundial fibroids, which is exophytic, or the ones that are in the broad ligament can mimic a solid axonal mass, such as an ovarian fibroma. So, for example, here, there's all this, this, this is the uterus here, this is the adnexal mass. Is that a myoma or an ovarian mass? Now, one of the things you can use is the bridging vessels. If you see bridging vessels going from the uterus into the lesion, it might be a sign that this is more likely to be a pedunculate fibroid. But I think in this case, it's really helpful to have an MR that shows that these are basically pedunculate fibroids. In this case, it's really on ultrasound, I think it'd be difficult sometimes to make the distinction between pedunculated myoma and ovarian lesion unless you see the ovary separate from it. Of course, the first thing to do is try to find the ovary separate from this lesion, and then your uh, work becomes a lot more sim simple. So again, another, so here, we see this, um, this, this lesion here, this lesion here. So these this were actually ovarian fibromas. You can see that it's part of the ovary with the hemorrhagic cyst. But again, MR is helpful. You can see that uterus is normal. But there is this low signal intensity lesion that's still there in fibroma. So, so they can have a typical appearance, particularly if you have degeneration. And what happens is when they overgrow their blood supplies, they can have various types of degeneration, either hyaline, mixoid, cystic, or hemorrhagic. And they really have a variable appearance on ultrasound. They may have calcifications, that's fine, we see that all the time, but they can be cystic or they can be echogenic. And these are the ones that rarely, but sometimes cause acute pain. If you have acute degeneration of myoma, and this can happen sometimes in pregnancy in particular, that's one of the times when myoma can cause pain. Otherwise, they usually don't cause pain. They can cause vaginal bleeding, but no pain. So these are examples of a cystic degeneration. So this is a cystic lesion in the, in the uterus, not a typical appearance for myoma. This Patient also happened to have a, a left ovarian dermoid, but you can see here on the MR again this uh, cystic degeneration with no enhancement, but just in, not no enhancement in the cystic portion, but enhancement in the rest of the fibroids. And I think in these cases, having an MR to confirm the diagnosis is really, really helpful. Sometimes, and this is a patient who presented with back and pelvic pain, this is a more echogenic mass. And the patient had a CT actually initially because, because of the pain. And you can see here that this myoma doesn't enhance the way they, most, they, they should enhance normally, again, because of the cystic degeneration. That's probably why this patient had pain. And then there is this unusual lesion. It's a rare lesion, a lipolyomyoma, which is a rare fatty benign tumor. Usually, typically affect peri- or postmenopausal women around 45 to 55. And what they look like is a very echogenic mass with some areas of shadowing within the uterus. It basically looks like a large cystic teratoma, except it's in the uterus. And so this is a lipolyomyoma on ultrasound. And the CT here, which was actually done prior to the ultrasound, confirmed the fact that this is a predominantly fatty mass. Not a common lesion, but some, and this was actually an older patient, 76-year-old. What should we do if you see growth over time? So we know that these lesions are estrogen and progesterone dependent. And the growth can be associated with pregnancy, endometrial cycles, tamoxifen treatment, or degeneration. And they can grow, especially during the fifth decade of life. So the rate of growth, that's the other complicating factor, is the rate of growth doesn't really correlate with risk of lyomyosarcoma. But we know that they should regress after menopause. So if you see a very large uterus, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes, in an older woman, then we have to worry about the presence of lyomyosarcoma. So this is a symptomatic enlarging myoma. This is a 36-year-old patient who presents with acute abdominal pain. And the fibroid here that we see here had increased from 3 centimeters on a prior CT 
the nine centimeter in a more recent CT. And of course, then we were really quite concerned about it. But at surgery, what happened was, and that's probably why she had a pain, she had benign myoma with torsion and necrosis. We all were worried that it was a lyomyosarcoma because of the very rapid enlargement. Turns out that probably because she had torsion and necrosis, it enlarged. Who knows? So a couple of te technical tips. If there is more uterine enlargement, our best image with transabdominal ultrasound. And, you know, at, at least in the U.S., everybody always wants to wash and do as many patients as possible. And sometimes these patients come with a, a script of only doing a transvaginal ultrasound. And if the patient has a large fibroid, I always insist that please get a few pictures with transabdominal to better appreciate the extent of the lesion. This is a very large fibroid that extended up to the patient's umbilicus. But if you see a very large uterus, you have to think about a differential diagnosis. Could be myoma, could be lyomyomatosis or metastasing lyomyoma, or could be malignant tumors which are of the myometrium which are rare but can happen. And this includes sarcoma, metastasis, and very, very rarely lymphoma. So when we do we think about uterine sarcoma? First of all, they're very uncommon. The vast majority of lyomyosarcoma but there are also these carcinosarcoma, malignant mixed malarian tumors, which occur in older women, or also peanut. And basically, what they do is that they can mimic fibroids on, on imaging, particularly in ultrasound. And MR is the best imaging modality, particularly if you see restricted diffusion. But I would suspect sarcoma, if there is rapid uterine enlargement, or if there is a very large bulky uterus in an older woman, or if there are metastatic nodes or nodules. So look around, look in the groin, look, look for ascites, or if the patient, of course, has lung metastasis or other more distant disease. So I'll just show you a couple examples. This is a very large uterus, almost 19 centimeter uterus, in a 68 year old woman who had postmenopausal bleeding and a negative endometrial biopsy, because, of course, it wasn't the endometrium that was affected. And she had this very large heterogeneous uterus. But what we saw in addition to this is this left inguinal region mass here. And so we know then that this is very likely that it's going to be a sarcoma. And it turned out to be a high-grade sarcoma. This was a young woman, 36-year-old, with, again, very, very large uterus, 24 centimeters, heterogeneous, but otherwise, again, in a young woman like this, you wouldn't necessarily think about, um, you know, sarcoma. So we just said she had fibroids and she had persistent cough. And then a few uh, weeks later, she be she had a CT scan for persistent cough. And lo and behold, she had all these long pulmonary and forceful metastasis. And again, on the PET CT, you can see the very large uterus and there is a lot of duration already, so the PET is just positive at the edge, but she had positive lung lesions. Unusual case in a very young woman. 